Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our NOAA Evidence into Practice Luncheon Speaker Series Volume 2, uh, Session 3, Economic Evaluation in Mental Health. Today our speakers will be Dr. Phil Jacobs and Dr. Elaine Lissage. I'll welcome Phil Jacobs up first. The, well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak. Um, I'm going to speak for about, can you hear me? I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes and then Dr. Lesage, who's a psychiatrist from the University of Montreal and certainly the leading uh, person in health policy, mental health policy in Canada today, will be speaking afterwards and then we'll leave some time for questions. Oh. I'm too close. Okay. Is this better? Is it, is this better? Sorry. Oh, for live stream. Oh. Okay. Um, there was uh, three people. There was an epidemiologist, an accountant, and an economist. The minister of health had a problem with a new medical device and she wanted to know whether or not the province should adopt the new medical device and so she brought the three groups into the the three people into the room the epidemiologist on the left the economist on the right and the accountant in the middle and she asked them if if they could provide her with some advice the epidemiologist said well, that's quite easy. Just look at the difference in, uh, in effectiveness, in outcomes, the difference in outcomes between the, on the one hand, the desired or the proposed technology or intervention, and on the other hand, an alternative intervention or possibly the one you're using now. Q would stand for the intervention, he said, or for the outcome, rather. And one and two are the two alternatives. Okay. Uh, so what he had is he suggested that they use Q1, Q2 versus minus Q1 as the measure of uh, of what of effectiveness, and that would give you the answer. The accountant didn't agree. And the accountant said, no, it's, it's money, it's what you pay, the price of the interventions, the cost of the interventions. Whichever one is cheaper, that's what you go with. So that was his. And the economist came next and said, you're both right. In fact, it's the cost effectiveness, the difference in cost between the interventions per unit of output used or unit of... Uh, outcome developed. In other words, dollars, two minus dollars one, divided by the outcome, the difference in outcome or the effectiveness of the two technologies or interventions. So that's what economics is, is this. It's not just looking at outcomes and effectiveness. It's not just looking at cost but it's looking at the difference in outcomes, uh, in cost rather, divided by the difference in outcomes. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about today in the next 15 or so minutes, is the economic evaluation in mental health and what it is. Okay, economics <coughs> then, as, uh, as I've said, according to the, really, the father of modern economics, as far as I'm concerned, he says it's all about limited scarce means or resources. So he focused on resources, but then he said, which can fulfill unlimited means. In other words, we have an unlimited uh, people who need, who need health care, unlimited people with health problems, but we only have limited resources to go around. So we've got to make choices. And that in, uh, in his book, The Nature and Scope of, uh, of Political Economy, uh, this 
particular economist focused on the relationship between ends and means. Okay, what about mental health economics? Well, mental health economics is wider than mental health care resources. In other words, there are resources that we're interested in that go to mental health. But actually, mental health economics is wider because there are other resources. So it focuses on the impact and treatment of mental illness. But mental health care resources are uh, resources like psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, nurses, combining them into teams. It's also mental health hospitalizations, emergency department uh, care, pharmaceuticals, and community and residences. All of these are focused, resources that are specifically focused on mental health. However, there are related resources, and that amount is really very wide and very significant. It includes social services, criminal justice, because many people with mental health do uh, encounter issues in the, in the criminal justice system, education, which is, as we'll see later, one of the widest providers of um, mental health services for younger people, housing, we know that there's many problems with mental illness and housing, uh, in, sorry, many problems for the homeless, many of which, but not all, are problems related to mental illness. And there's counseling as well. So we can see that the resources in devoted to mental health, and we'll, s we'll see what they are later, are significant, but they're not but even more significant in terms of volume of resources are these other areas of the public, public welfare or public dollars <coughs> that uh, deal with people with mental illness and they're related. But even more so, the economic burden of mental illness goes beyond just resources. There's resources like direct resources, which we've just talked about, services provided by the government, by nonprofits, and privately. And there's also indirect productivity, loss of work, loss, uh, work loss. These two are related to mental health. But in addition to that, there's transfer payments, which are payments for people who can't work. They are not resource payments. In other words, they're not directly related to resources. Nevertheless, they're an important component of mental illness. And finally, there's what some people call, not me, but a lot of people call human costs. In the court system, it's huge, this. Pain and suffering, payments for pain and suffering. Um, in ta they call them intangibles. And these are, <coughs> loss of well-being. Um, they're not resources directly, but they are very important components of mental illness. So although we're concerned with the dollars that go into mental illness and, the, and paying for resources, that really isn't enough just to focus on those dollars. So the, the accountant in our example was much too narrow, although even if the accountant looked at transfer payments, um, which are not resources, sorry about that. Thanks. Um, the, 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 the total uh, economic burden and burden is much, much larger than just the resources themselves or the transfer payments. <clears throat> There's three types of economic studies. The economic burden, the economic analysis, which is supply and demand, and asking why things happen, what encourages uh, people to use or not use services, and economic evaluation, the third type of economics, which is, which is cost effectiveness, cost benefit, and probably what you're more, more familiar with, social return on investment. If we just looked at the economic burden, <clears throat> um, we 
Wang did, um, in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry in 2017 compared mental health resources in provinces in the past 10 years, 2003 to 2013. What you'll find if you look at these is that hospitalization costs increased quite considerably in most provinces, especially New Brunswick, but other provinces as well. Other resources increased too. But what's disturbing about the increase in hospitalization is that's exactly what we didn't want to happen. Nobody wanted to see more hospitalization. The conventional wisdom, even back at the turn of the century, was that <clears throat> community resources should replace hospital resources. People should be moved in the community. We failed to do that, and that did not happen in the past decade, and possibly still not happening today. So the goals, the main goals in to integrate people with mental illness into the community have not been achieved. The other thing, I'm, <coughs> another aspect of resources that I just want to point out is provincial mental health related expenditures for youths, data that we're just collecting now. And if you notice, where do youths aged 12 to 17 get their primary mental health care? And Dr. Lesage will be talking about uh, primary health care a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> almost 50% goes comes from public health schools. It's in public health schools. Not a lot. Some of it is psychologists, but the rest is counselors and teachers. And that's where most of the resources for the youth go. Then there's hospitalization and psychiatrists. Um, probably criminal justice is quite big as well, as is um, social welfare. So that's where our mental health dollars are going. The question that we have to ask, and we've been asking it for quite a significant amount of time, and that Dr. Uh, Lesage does have the answers, is, is this the best way to use the resources? Is this the best way to use those substantial dollars that we're spending, um, 50 million alone in the school system, a uh, total of 154 million, and there's still, it probably will end up being 180 million that when we finish counting all the resources. Is that the best way that we can do it? Is, that, is putting people in hospitals the best way? And that's one thing I want to talk about <coughs> for the next couple of minutes. Is, approach, is economic evaluation. And to give you a brief example, <clears throat> guidelines for economic evaluation have been released four times in the past 20 years. And one of them is for uh, these guidelines for Canada are come from CADF, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Health. It's free, it's on the web, it's on the web, you can download it. And they, they tell you, they give you advice on how to conduct an economic evaluation. So <clears throat> they basically use the economic component, looking at the difference in costs divided by the difference in outcomes, where one and two are alternative interventions. The change in costs, it's the change in cost in relation to change in outcome. And the main components of the guidelines are, you have to have a comparator intervention, one or two, in the uh, in the, in the equation, uh, you have to choose a perspective. In other words, government or private out of pay pocket or societal. You have to choose timelines for your analysis. How long do you want to measure it? Mental illnesses often go for years. Uh, you have to choose an outcome and you have to choose costs. Those are the main, the prime guidelines and they tell you in the document how to use them. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example, a brief example, of a project that's undergoing going on in Alberta. The target group was youths aged 12 to 18, mostly females. Um, there's one to three mental health hospitalizations per six month period is what these people were experiencing, these youths. And also the caregiving they're, the parent caregivers <coughs> were, um, 
were also having to deal with these mental illnesses. The intervention was a, com a combined clinical social service education, all combined, rather than having the services not integrated. The, com <coughs> the comparator intervention was normal conditions, which is separate services. The purpose was to improve the conditions leading to hospitalization and try and reduce the very costly hospitalizations. And the perspective was the perspective of the government, uh, which is the program itself plus education, criminal justice, and social services. And <coughs> the timelines of the study were the duration that the person was in the program, about 300 days was the average person in the program, six months pre-admission and six months post-discharge to see if there was any difference before and after. The outcomes could have been standard measure that economists use called utility or quality adjusted life years. Um, we chose, we didn't find, we couldn't get that information. And there are no quality adjusted life year indicators for children in that age. So the analysis was we used a child wellness index, CGAS, and selected outcomes for caregivers. The outcome measures of our study weren't great. So here's what happened. The program cost $140,000 for about 300 days. Now that sounds like a lot. Uh, you know, if I imagine you would say, just on the basis of what the accountant at the beginning of this uh, lecture um, said is we measure it by cost. Well, that's a lot of money to spend on one youth um, in a program. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the if we just looked at it from the accountant's view, that's what we would have selected as the outcome measure. But the program opportunity cost, which is very important, which is the savings, <coughs> were in fact $48,000 um, because for 300 days they were going to be hospitalized elsewhere. You saved that. And that's a saving. It doesn't appear on any formal record, but it's nevertheless quite significant saving. And then there's the pre minus the, sorry, the pre minus the post program costs. If they were hospitalized before, but we reduced hospitalization after. That was $40,000. So the net program cost <coughs> was $52,000. But each year, if you just look at a timeline for the six month after, you're still costing $52,000, a lot less than your budget. In addition to that, there's a net gain for each subsequent, subsequent year if, you're, if the program works you're saving $40,000. And we chose to use a payback measure, which is 2.3 years. In other words, this youth, if the program works, this expensive program, will pay itself back in 2.3 years. So <clears throat> the cost consequences of the program is for one year post-program, the net cost to the youth is $52,000. There was some gain in outcome measures. There was gain in well-being for caregivers. But most importantly, there was a, this incorporates a large gain in reduced hospitalizations, potentially working itself for many years. <clears throat> it's difficult to get better measures of outcome for this group. And um, we, we basically determined what the counterfactual, what the opportunity cost of the program was. The data is not great. The accountant certainly wouldn't accept it. But if you're evaluating a program like this, you've got to look at the opportunity costs, not just the budget cost of the program. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lesage, who, as I said, is really the leading policy person in mental uh, mental illness and mental health in the country.
So I will try to uh, present some of the added value of health economic studies in relation to mental health and addiction planning uh, in, uh, in Canada in each of our respective province. Steve Lurie, uh, Order of Canada recently, a social worker and uh, head of the Canadian Mental Health Association uh, in Ontario, just declared recently that 9% is entering the lexicon of Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. What does that 9% mean? Well, uh, a paper by Phil Jacobs and, uh, in 2003 look at the expenditures on mental health and addictions for Canadian provinces in 2003 and 2004. And uh, they showed that this varied by province. The public mental health spending was 6% of total public spending on health, while total mental health spending was 5% of total health spending. So when we talk about 9% in Ontario, it's that probably most of our Canadian provinces were at 6% at the moment and we need to move at 9% at least. Other countries, in particular the United Kingdom, but also Australia, who have been at the forefront of uh, reform in mental health and greater spending, as you can see, it's close to 12%. This was presented also in a, an editorial of the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry in both languages. I think it's been sent to all of you. So it starts in French. So maybe you say, well, why can I read it? But you, you'd see that it's uh, in both languages. If it is, in a way, it's close to a position of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, too, if they let it being published as an editorial in both languages. It was with, professor, with Dr. Roger Bland, who is known here in, uh, in uh, Alberta, uh, psychiatrist and respected figure in uh, uh, planning uh, at the Canadian Psychiatric Association, Jan Bosgrave, a psychiatrist and a champion of assertive community treatment. Uh, Egan Johnson, who was the former CEO of the Institute of Health Economics, so a health economist. Mike Kirby, which you may have known, who was a senator who led the Senate Committee uh, on uh, Mental Health the first one on mental health in, in Canada in the 2007 and then was the first uh, head of the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And still very active as you can see, uh, his association is very uh, significant. And uh, Hélène Maria Vassiliadis, who is a health uh, services researcher doing also health economics uh, and uh, many of her work uh, will be presented from now on. So, uh, in a way, it was in January 2017, and we suggested in our editorial that there should be a, a, a mental health uh, transition fund. Mike Kirby was suggesting that in, uh, as early in 2007. And uh, mind you, in March 2017, the federal government announced a 10-year, $5 billion mental health transition fund. Basically, it would represent for each province approximately maybe 10% of the de facto mental health budget or 0.5% of the health budget. So in itself, it won't bring you from 6% to 9% in any province, but it would be representing certainly a lever, a direction for which for each province to move progressively over a period of, uh, of 10 years. Now, it should be spent wisely. And uh, as mentioned, uh, not necessarily on more hospital beds, even though uh, in the consensus conference uh, commissioned by your government here in Alberta to the Institute of Health Economics in November 2014, transitions to the community of mental health services for severely mentally ill. In the final recommendation, it was stressed that we should stop closing beds but we should develop appropriately home care and uh, community care uh, to the required numbers so that we have a balanced mental uh, uh, system of care with dignity for the most severely mentally ill. And then on the other hand, 
on structured psychotherapy for common mental disorders in the primary care context. Common mental disorders uh, are about it's 10 to 15 percent of the population, maybe, uh, one in five. And the majority are identified and treated by primary care physicians in this country with some support of uh, psychotherapists. So let's talk about the intensive home care and some proof, uh, like we mentioned uh, with the true figures that we saw in uh, Dr. Jacob's uh, presentation. Let's talk about the at-home demonstration project in five Canadian cities was a cluster randomized trial demonstrating that intensive home care and rent supplements resulted in greater home te tenure and quality of life for homeless, severely mentally ill. It was published uh, in the uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's rare that you see psychosocial intervention being published in such a prestigious journal of medicine. It tells about the quality of it, but also of the need in social uh, sector, and mental health is halfway between health and social sector, to conduct demonstration projects for key, to eliminate key decisions that you would like to make, like uh, the uh, supplemental rent here. In uh, the World Health Organization is also recommending for uh, some large uh, social experiments to conduct a uh, randomized clinical trial to, to inform about the value of the, interve the intervention. One famous uh, uh, economist uh, uh, at working for the World Health Organization is uh, Esther Duflo. She is a French economist. Uh, uh, she has a chair at Collège de France, but also a chair at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she was an advisor to uh, President Obama. She's known as, uh, in, uh, for work uh, as la randomista in, uh, in Spanish. That is, she favored randomized trial on demonstration project of the type that we see here. The cost analysis of the at-home project showed an average cost of $53,000 per year per person homeless. So you might think, wow, we think that these people are abandoned, but do we spend so much? And yes, we, the expenditure are spread over psychiatric and physical hospitalization, shelters, police and court appearance, outpatient, and social benefits. And this is part of a paper by Latimer uh, on the costs of, of services for homeless people with mental illness in five Canadian cities, a large prospective follow-up study in the Canadian Medical Association uh, Journal Open. And again, these papers are, uh, are being made available uh, to you. Let's turn now to psychotherapy and primary care. Uh, this is from a paper with uh, Hélène Maria Vassiliadis, again Eric Latimer. Uh, Martin Drapeau was uh, uh, vice president of the Order of Psychologists and a researcher at McGill. And, uh, uh, we started by showing that, uh, remembering that psychotherapy is as effective as medication for common mental disorders of anxiety and depression, 10 to 15 percent of the population, and most effective in combination for more chronic cases. There's also two reports uh, from health technology agencies like uh, Institute of Health in Canada with that regards. One is from the INES in uh, Quebec, l'Institut national d'excellence en santé des services sociaux, two reports very recently on, on that uh, supporting this. And, uh, and also there's the HQO in Ontario just this August also produced a report recommending public financing of uh, psychotherapy on the basis of this type of information. Now the cost and benefits modeling came to the same conclusions as the one that was produced in 2007 in the UK and in France. Uh, Basically, it costs us more from a societal perspective to not treat everybody. This is a rare intervention. Do you know many health interventions at the moment that you would say, well, at the moment, 
if we would treat everybody, it would uh, cost us less <laughs> as a society when we consider all the costs and the benefits of it. Now, let me and let you enter about, uh, when you think of psychotherapy, you would say, well, it should, maybe we should give priority to you. Because common mental disorders starts, 50% of them start before the age of uh, 18. Uh, or maybe we should give the priority to the, to the workers because that's where the, we would reduce the incapacity and the benefits would be uh, greater from a societal uh, perspective and it's a greater number of people. But people over 65, psychotherapy should be a priority. Consider this now. About 10% of uh, people over 65 take sleeping pills for insomnia, which can be seen as a form of anxiety disorder. This is a paper by uh, Cara Tannenbaum. She's a geriatrician. She's the, also the scientific director of the Institute of Aging at the Canadian Institute of Health Research. And then you have other researchers, and again, uh, and then Maria Basiliadis, who was responsible for the cost benefit modeling analysis. Brief structured psychotherapy, five to six sessions, is as effective as medication and does not have the rare but catastrophic side effects of falls. Mind you, it will relieve this little misery of not sleeping well. But day to day become quite a misery for a great number of uh, people. So that form of treatment may relieve them of it, and, uh, but without the risk like medication of falls. So maybe the only risk, maybe, maybe that if they take the psychotherapy, they get uh, better, they socialize better, they tend to talk about other things, maybe they can fall in love. So this, then there was a cost effectiveness model that was favorable to brief psychotherapy from the health budget perspective. Psychotherapy reduced healthcare costs of falls in the elderly population. So I hope that I have uh, shown that uh, cost analysis may illuminate the choices we made. For example, when we look at the impact, the budget impact, or the comparison of a budget, when we look like for the homeless, uh, mentally ill, the de facto way we spend money, and whether we're happy with it, and whether some interventions can shift, even though the costs may be the same, but maybe we can spend it differently with better results, obviously. And then we can look at the cost benefits modeling as reducing the uncertainties about choices we can make. Choices we can make about publicly financing psychotherapy, about uh, uh, introducing and uh, financing uh, psychotherapy for insomnia, for elderly uh, people, a growing uh, problem, and uh, with an immediate impact if it will be put in place, not only on the society, but on the budget of the mental health budget or the health budget of uh, your province. Thank you very much, and we'll take uh, questions together.